represented here today, whether they give, whether they don't give. Father, I just pray, Lord, that you would bless them, that you would touch them. Father, that, that, that you know, you, this is the only thing, Lord, that you ever said, try me in this. And Lord, I just pray that those, if, you, if they're not tithers, that they'll try, they'll try you. And Father, that you'll show yourself strong. Father, you will, you will show yourself to be a, a faithful and a true God. And so, Lord, I just thank you for the blessings that you've poured out on us. Lord, I look around and, and see that we have all received. Yeah, we might have troubles, but we've all received more than we deserve. Probably. Amen. And, Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you that every good and perfect gift comes from you. We know, Lord, that you are a good father and a faithful father, and we just want to honor you today. Thank you for our church. Thank you, Lord, for the mission that you have given us to proclaim to our, our city and our neighborhood. That the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. And Father, thank you that as we give, we do give so that the church so that will be meet in this house. And Father, I just pray blessings on every person in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. After the offering is passed, the kids can be dismissed. And Lord, we bless our children's workers today. We speak obedience and joy on our children. Yes, sir. Yes, you sir. You may. Hey, guys. I get kind of envious that the women are always getting together for ladies' fellowship. And, yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, we're going to have this Saturday night a men's fellowship. Uh, hopefully it will be one of many this fall and winter. Uh, Debbie and I were blessed to uh, get an RV. Uh, we got a motorhome sitting up at a lot outside of Lowell. And uh, we're going to have Saturday night a get-together for the guys. Awesome. It starts at 6 o'clock. Uh, this is, if you go up 60 past Lowell, um, it's the second campground. First turn about a mile up is tortoises down in there, a bunch of RV plates, uh, RVs down in there behind the trees. If you go there, you're not going to find this. In the straight stretch. Then you go past into the straight stretch, about another half mile, stone house, campgrounds, um, on the left-hand side there against the Muskegon River. Uh, lot 23, it's the only motorhome sitting there, so it should be easy enough to pick out. Uh, looking forward for a time, to have a good time together, a uh, time of fellowship. We're gonna build six? Six o'clock on six Saturday. We're going to build each other up uh, in the Lord, plus we're going to have some uh, activities. You want to fish, make sure you get a license so you're legal. Uh, you want to swim in the river, that's your choice. <laughs> but we're going to, uh, if you guys got... Uh, Cornhole, or uh, I got horseshoes. So you want to play volleyball, whatever. I've got two lots on one side, one lot on the other side. They're empty. We've got plenty of room. You want to just come up and watch the Olympics? I'll turn on the TV out there. But I'll tell you what, I think it's more important for us to get together and we'll start doing some things. Uh, Amen. Teenage boys. Right? Yeah, bring some food. <laughs> <laughs> bring some food and something to drink. If you're planning to bring something, let me know. Uh, Teenage boys are also welcome. Uh, need to, uh, they need to have examples. You know, I, I just, and I'll, I'll say this and I'll shut up and I'll go along with it, but I've watched the Olympics since this opened. A lot of great examples. A lot of great examples. People that have overcome adversity. People that others, you know, life is not ideal. We see a, a world champion female gymnast that her parents were less than ideal, and yet someone adopted her, and she's an overcomer. Amen. We need to adopt people and make them overcomers. You're my brother, you're my sister. I watch people, uh, yes, they, uh, uh, I've seen so many people fall and yet finish the race. Finish the race even though they were injured. I watched yesterday, uh from the United States. Uh, he was out there running. They were competing against the Ethiopians and the Kenyans, top class runners. And his buddy from 
Great Britain was his training buddy. Somehow they bumped knees and locked ankles and his buddy fell down. And I see him pull off to the side of the race and look back and wait for his great Britain buddy to get up and start running. Amen. And he apologized to the accident they put him, but he ran with him. He encouraged them. They took turns taking the lead. Uh, his buddy took first place. He was fifth, but that was okay. Because they came studying together. They beat the course. They beat their personal best times. And they've gone on and on. And you know, God one day is going to say, give us honor. And you know, all these medals that are won, I'm glad I see these Christian athletes sit there. And they get done and they, they reach the epitome and the world of honor to, to see them say, give them all glory to God. Amen. Amen. You know, and they, they don't just get out there. They're, you know, like the one said, I, I'm in the gym over 300 days a year. Christianity is not a, you know, two day a year thing. We, we've got to push out a day. Oh, yeah. We're going to fall down. We're going to get hurt. But we get back up. And we reach back and we encourage that person that's fallen down and say, let's push on. We're going to finish this together. So, oh, yeah. again, 6 o'clock Saturday is important time to get there. Saturday, 6 o'clock. You can bring something. Let me know. Even firewood wouldn't hurt. I don't have a yeah. fire, but I don't know how big of a fire we're going to have. Uh, I like fire. <laughs> so, see you there. I've done cool that. Fireman likes fire. Fireman likes fire. Thank you, Jack. Yeah, you, you guys probably look at me and say, he's built like those swimmers. <laughs> <laughs> what? What are you laughing at? All those things that be not as though they be. <laughs> For your word today. Father, thank you that it's true. Lord, that you wrote it to us. Father, that we can... We can do what it says we can do and be what, who, who it says we can be. And Father, that it is a foundation for our life. It's not just some words. It's not just suggestions. But Lord, it is, it is our Lord and our Savior in writing to us. He is the Word. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are the great teacher. Hallelujah. <laughs> I read a really good book while I was on vacation at the beach. I can't remember the title, but it doesn't really matter. I think it was in his presence by the way he told me. Um, and and uh, he, was, he was talking about Christianity, and he was talking about theologians. And you, ever, you ever read something, and it just, you know, you, you were feeling something, and you didn't know how to say it, and, and then you read it, and it's like, yeah, I'm with that guy. He was saying that you know, you if you give you give God's word to theologians, nothing against theologians. Really. Um, they could take something that God meant to be beautiful and break it down into little bits and pieces that really don't mean anything. Kind of like the definition of a specialist. You know what the definition of a specialist is? That's a man who learns more and more about less and less until he knows absolutely everything there is to know about nothing at all. <clears throat> but he basically was saying, you know, if we if we if we break down and, and if it's all about theology and all about doctrines, we can take the life out of being Christian. And you know. Doctrine is good. Doctrine is good. We don't. We, we believe certain things. There are certain things that we believe. We believe that there's only one way to get to heaven. His name is Jesus. Right? We believe that this is this is God's inspired word to us. We believe we believe that there's one God, and He's in. You know. However you want to, he, he exists in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But he's one God. You know, there's certain things that are doctrinal that, uh, you know, if, if there's a man or a woman out there who believes that, that the only way to heaven is, is through Jesus Christ alone, faith in him and believing in him, believing that all men are sinners and, and, and all men need a Savior, and they believe that if you believe in Jesus Christ in your heart and confess it with your mouth that you're born again, well, then they're my brother. 
Whether they speak in tongues, whether they don't speak in tongues. Whether they have a piano in their church or don't have a piano in their church. doesn't really matter. It's about, it's about having a relationship with Jesus. Nobody's going to walk through into, into heaven and, and, and you know, God's going to say, Okay, well, let me see your church membership card. You know, let me see your let me see your baptism paper. Let me see your catechism paper. Or not. No, he says to either enter into my rest or depart from me. I never knew you. It's about knowing Jesus. And there's a there's one scripture you guys ever. You know, how many of you ever read Song of Solomon? It's a great book. Very good book. Um, it has a lot of application. To husbands and wives has a lot of, and it has what it really is pointing to is how Christ loves the church, Amen. And there's in, in the Song of Solomon, chapter six, verse three, he simply says this: "I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine." That is the heart of Christianity. You know. That, that Jesus loves his church. And his church is not his church is not this building. It's not you know the Catholic Church of Marietta is awesome. It's a fantastic piece of architecture. But it's not about that architecture. It's about you. It's about the people that go there. It's about the people who know Jesus. It's about it's about flesh and blood. Who, who know Jesus, have a relationship with Him, and, and love Him. It's not, about, it's not about keeping a bunch of rules. It's not about not having any fun. I used to think that's what it was. But it's about knowing the Savior and knowing the person who loved you enough to go to the cross and die for you. It's about, it's about having a relationship with a person who was willing to say, you deserve to be punished, but I'll take that punishment and I'll bear it on my shoulders and I'll take it for you. And and not and not just saying, okay, well thanks. Appreciate that. But starting a relationship with him and continuing in that relationship with him. Knowing that knowing that not only do I have Jesus, but Jesus has me. That, you know, Peggy and, I, Peggy and I walked down the aisle 29 years ago in six months or something like that. Five months. Seems like it was shorter than that. And, you know, she put a ring on my hand, I put a ring on her hand. We didn't really know a whole lot about what we were doing. Um, but that day, she became mine, and I became hers. And the, the relationship that we have with Christ is the same one. You know, it, that, that is a mirror of what, of what, you know, our relationship with Christ really is. That's probably the closest um, physical or worldly I don't think I don't think marriage is worldly. That's not the right word. Earthly, maybe. Terrestrial. How about that? That's a big word. That's worth a quarter. <clears throat> but but that relationship that husband and wife have um, is is a lot like the relationship that we have with Christ. That not not only is my beloved mine, but I am His. I I have. I have not only make it, made him my savior, but he's my Lord. You know? And, and, and walking with him. You know, every... <clears throat> I, I will admit to you, and this will be hard for you to believe, but Peggy has not been a perfect wife. <laughs> Nor have I even come close to being a perfect husband. But we still love each other dearly. Jesus is perfect. God's love is perfect. Yes. He's never failed. He's not, you know, there have been times when I haven't shown up when I was supposed to show up 
or I didn't say the right thing, or I wasn't feeling the right thing um, towards my wife. But Jesus has never been that way. He's never thought bad about me. He's always thought good about me. He's always been there for me. He's always forgiven me. And he's always picked me up. You know, there's times when I fail Peggy and she's failed me. But our relationship continues. And God's love never fails. So even though I fail, I have failed Jesus and, and fallen down and not met his, you know, not, not done everything that I was supposed to do. And I still know. He still loves me. He's still there for me. He's, a, he's never left me. And, and knowing him is what Christianity is all about. You know, we've made it about a lot of things. Um, you know, I, I, I could preach lots of messages. We, I, could, I could preach on deliverance, or I could preach on healing, or I could preach on, you know, finances, or how to raise your kids, or how to be a husband, or there's a lot of things. But what we really need to understand is, is how, to, how to love Christ, and how to walk with Him. Because all that other stuff flows out of that. You know, knowing... Knowing and, and having a, a time and just being and realizing that wherever I go, whatever I'm doing, Jesus is with me. His Spirit, His Holy Spirit is in me. To know that whenever I, I'm facing a trial and something's not going right, that He's interceding for me. That He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And He is praying for me. That He's there for me. <clears throat> Knowing that, knowing that, that he's not somebody, have you ever, have you ever had somebody in your life that you'd like to talk to, but you were afraid to, because they were like, you felt like they were up here and you're down here and, and, and you, you know, and you, you just, Jesus is not like that. He's not like that. He is the exalted Son of God. The only begotten Son of God. He is the creator. The word says that he created everything. And there's nothing that he, he didn't create. That, that by his word he upholds everything in this world. That he's perfect in all of his ways. Yet he has time for me. And he has time for you. That he's not an inapproachable or an unapproachable God, but he is a God who says, Come unto me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. That's that's who we serve. Amen? Amen. And that's what I want to talk, that's who I want to talk to you about. Um, turn to Hebrews chapter four. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to run through Hebrews chapter two. The whole chapter, because um, I want to teach some doctrine too, because knowing the doctrine of what or what the relationship is about is is good, right? I know I know when Peggy and I, when Peggy and I got married, we had to watch these videos, and they you know Pastor Steve made us watch these videos, and, and they told us some guidelines and 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 uh, some rules and not rules rules that's probably not the right word, some helpful hints maybe. Some suggestions and some, as a, you know, here, this will help you in your marriage. And trust me, we were completely unprepared to get married, but that's all right. It worked out. It works out great if you love each other and you hang on. And anyway, but those, there were some of those things in that, in those videos that made sense. You know, like. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. That means, that means don't go to bed mad. Um, you know, to forgive, forgive one another. Because if you don't forgive, you can't be forgiven. Um, to know that, that, that it's important to talk to each other, communicate. I mean, yeah, just simple, basic stuff. And and you know, when we read the Word of God, the Word of God is to help us understand how to walk with Christ, right? 
So that's why we're going to learn a little doctrine today. But Hebrews chapter 4, verse 4, or er, 14 first. It says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we, prof we profess. A high priest is a person, a, a person who represents man to God. Okay? Um, <clears throat> not, not a person who represents God to, to man, but a person who represents man to God. Okay? And one of the qualifications for a priest is that a priest has to be drawn out of the people that he represents. Okay? So, if, if, if we're men, then Jesus had to be a man. Uh, and I'll show you why here in just a second. It says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was at, without sin. Amen. Next verse. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace and help in our time of need. Here's something that I want you to really get today. It doesn't matter what you're being tempted with. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what thoughts are flying through your head. It, it doesn't matter. Jesus has been tempted in every way that, that we have been. And so what, and what, what God's trying to get across to us is this. He is a high priest who understands. He's not someone who's not he's not someone who's never been through any difficult times, who's never been tested, who's never been tried. He's not someone who, who can't relate to us. He relates to us on every level. He knows what we've been tempted with. He knows the thoughts that we've had. You know, you know like yeah, he's had the thought that or, or he's been tempted with choking the life out of somebody. Not until they just pass out there. All the way. Don't ever do that. Joseph Fight, or M, was it UFC? M? Anyway. Those guys, I could never do that because I always hated to get hit in the face. I'm not that tough. But anyway, Jesus has been tempted every way. And so he understands. The reason that that's, this scripture, that scripture is in the Bible is not so, you know, what, what most of us do when we fail and we know that we've fallen short and we've disappointed God, what we do is we hide. That's natural, right? What did Adam do when he, when he sinned in the garden the first time? He hid. He and Eve went and hid. And that's what we do. Shame, the, you know, we do something wrong, shame comes on us and we hide. And this scripture is there to say, look, Jesus has been tempted. The high priest, the person who's sitting at the right hand of the Father, has been tempted and he understands what happened. He knows where you are. And that, the scripture doesn't say, go away from him, go pay penance, go crawl on your knees through glass for a mile, and, and prove to God that you're sorry before you even come back here. There's some people that probably understand that better and believe that more. But that's not what who God is. The scripture says, he, you, he knows what you've been tempted with. He knows what you've been tried with. So approach the throne of grace with confidence. And I, and, and I like the way this is written. To receive mercy. To mercy's first. To receive mercy. Mercy is mercy is the I, I, the best way for me to explain mercy is that we don't get what we deserve. God was merciful to me when I'm here in pain. I, I deserved less. I got more. Praise God. Brag on it as you see it. That's true. See, we feel that shame because we've we've let God down. And and we don't want to go 
to God. We want to hide from God. But God says, no, when you, when you fall, come to me in confidence to receive mercy. Mercy, mercy allows God to forgive us. Mercy allows God to apply the blood of Jesus Christ to our life and cleanse us from all iniquity. And, and not, not just cover our sin as the blood of bulls and goats, but wipe it as far as the east is from the west and make us white as snow. Now turn to Hebrews chapter, oh, let me say one other thing. And find grace to help in time of need. We all need grace. God is, grace is, grace is God's power to operate in our life. Grace is, is, is the, uh, grace is what opens up the kingdom of God to us. You know, we don't deserve to be called the sons of God. We don't deserve to have an inheritance with, with, with Almighty God. We don't deserve to have the Holy Spirit dwell in us. And to be called the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. But through his grace, he, he applies all that. You know, the, I, I guess the, the best, my, uh, it's probably, a, it's so a perfect an example, but the prodigal son, you know, the prodigal son went back to God and said, or went back to his father. And, he, and his, his idea was, Father, I know I don't deserve well, I don't deserve to be your son anymore. I've let you down. I've fallen. I've, I've messed up. I took your money and, and squandered it. And, and I've done unspeakable things. I don't deserve to be your son anymore. But just let me come back and be your servant. You know, that probably would have been, in worldly terms, that would have been fair. But God's not a worldly God. God's, God's not a God of... Uh, of just meeting our needs. God's a, God's a God of grace. And so when the son came back and he said, I'm not worthy to be your son anymore. Just, just let me be your son. The, the father looked at the son and he looked at his, his servants and he said, this is my son who was dead and is now alive. Put a ring on his finger. Put a robe on his back. Put some shoes on that boy. Kill the fatted calf. Because we're going to have a party tonight. That's grace. That's grace. And, and without mercy, we can't come into the grace. A lot of people, we want, we want, to, have, we want to have the access to God and the, and the presence of God. But until the blood of Jesus is applied to our life and, we're, and we are forgiven through God's mercy. And we become His and belong to Him and fellowship with Him. We don't have that. So we come boldly to the throne of grace and we receive mercy that washes us and cleanses us and brings us back into the family of God. And then God's grace opens up to us. I don't know about you, but I, I, got, some, I got goosebumps. God's goodness, mercy endures forever. They don't live on goosebumps, but I sure like them. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 2. Let's go there. Hebrews chapter 2. I'm going to read through, I'm going to read the whole chapter real quick. It says, We must pay careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we don't drift away. Next verse. <clears throat> How shall we escape? Do we miss we missed number two, I think? Or did, or did we not? Yeah, there we go. For if the message spoken by angels was binding in every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation which was first announced by the Lord was confirmed to us, to us by those who heard him. Let me stop for a second. He's talking about the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The difference between a, 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 a method or a a bunch of priestly laws where the sins of men were um, 
atoned for by the blood of bulls and goats, and once, once a year, a high priest would go into the presence of God and apply that blood to the mercy seat, and, and the sins of Israel would be covered for another year. That, it, it's saying that that, that, you know, that was important, that that mattered. That the you know it, that was that was the first covenant that God gave us, but we have a new covenant in Christ. That His His blood, once and for all, He went in. It wasn't the blood of bulls and goats, but it was the blood of a perfect man. It was the blood of a worthy man who had lived lived a sinless life that was applied to the mercy seat, which not that washed our sins away, took them away from us. If if. It says pay careful attention because if that first covenant applied, how much greater this new covenant, how much greater this salvation. He says, how, sh how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? And I, I want to say this to you. No person will ever stand before God and, and say, I did it my way. You know, you got to let me in. Um, I made it on my own merits. But here's the thing. No person, no person, I believe, will, will go to hell or be separated eternally from God who did not choose to go there. What do you mean people choose to go to hell? Yes. By rejecting such a great salvation. By refusing great salvation. You know, uh, there, there are people who do it all the time. We were out walking a couple of Wednesdays ago. And just walk up, you know, Pat said to a man, can I pray for you today? He said, no. Right? And I don't want any of that. And it's, a, it's the same way. God has provided... A salvation that is free to us, that has been paid for, that, that he says here. So I offer this to you. It's a gift. And not every person will receive it. And by refusing to receive that gift, they are choosing to be separated from God. Because there's only one way to get to God. And that's through Jesus Christ. But it's not hard. Actually, it's quite simple. But there will be people who choose to reject that gift. Right? All right. Let's go. Got to hurry. God also tested testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. Can we say this? The Bible says that, that every, let everything be confirmed by two or three witnesses. He's talking about that, that Jesus was confirmed as the salvation through the people who heard Him preach, the people uh, you know, who saw Him raised from the dead, this is who the writer's talking about, and also that God has testified that He is the Son of God through the miracles and the signs and the wonders and the things that he did. The things that uh, the things that Jesus did that, you know, even Nicodemus looked, talked to Jesus and he said, Lord, you know, we know that you're from God because nobody else can do the things that you're doing. He raised a man from the dead who'd been dead for more than three days and Lazarus healed the sick, uh, healed a person who'd been uh, blind and lame from, work, or from birth. Those are things that no man could do. Unless he was from God. And so he, he, he was testified as true, not only by the people who saw him and saw his life, but also by God and the miracles that he did. Next verse. It said, it's not the angels that he has subjected the world to come about which we are speaking. But there is a place where someone has testified, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the angels and you crowned him. With glory and honor. And putting everything under his feet. And putting everything under him. God left nothing that is not subject to him. Yet at present we do not see everything subject to him. Now let me 
let me talk to you about this. Is he talking about Jesus right here? Yes, in the sense that he's a man. But he's talking about us. He's talking about mankind. You know, if you talk to the scientists and you believe evolution and all that stuff, then we're really nothing. We're $2.48 worth of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. If, that, if that's what you believe. You know, we're no better off than the deer that's been run over on the road and, and is now a sail deer that is completely flat. I mean, we're just, that's all we are, if that's what you believe. But I want you to know that the Bible doesn't say that about you. The Bible doesn't say that you're just... $2.48 worth of chemicals joined together haphazardly and accidentally and you just happen to be here. It says, look, go back to verse 7, Susie. <clears throat> it says, you made him, and, it, and some of the scriptures say, for a little while lower than the angels. And you crowned him with glory and honor. How is mankind crowned with glory and honor? You are made in the image of God. You are made in the express image of God. No other creature is made in the image of God except mankind. And so you, we, we have been crowned with glory and honor. Now, next verse. <clears throat> and everything has been put under our feet. You know, when Adam and Eve were placed on the earth and God created them and he said it was good, everything, there was nothing on the earth that was not subject to, to Adam and Eve. He gave them their names. He told them what to do. They were all subject to him. God gave them everything to Adam and Eve and said, you take care of it. You tend the garden. And at the fall, that was taken away from us. And he says, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to him. We don't see everything subject to the kingdom of God right now. The world that we live in is not a, not a world that reflects the glory of God and the majesty of God and the, the authority of God. For the most part, there are places, right? Where, where God is invited in. But we see, we see murders and, and all kinds of stuff. And terrorism and poverty and sickness and disease. And all those things that God never created. All those things that God never intended. But all those things that entered because of sin. And so we live in a world where we don't see everything subject to us and to God. Next verse. I like this. It says, but Jesus. But we see Jesus. Who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. See, he was talking about man before when he said he was... A little lower, made a little lower than the angels, angels and crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. Right? So he's, he's relating, the author is relating the fact that Jesus is a man. Jesus came as a man. Right? And Adam was, a, or was originally made crowned with glory and honor and all that and Jesus came that way. All right. And bringing many sons. Back up, Susie. Got one more, the end of that verse. <clears throat> it says, because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. That's what our Savior did for us. Even though he was crowned with glory and honor. Even though he was not fallen. Even though he was not subject to sin, he went to the cross for you and for me. He tasted death for me and for you. Hallelujah. You know, you, we, we talk about death and talk about Christ's death, but, and, and, and you're looking, you look real somber. You've got your sad face on. This is a good thing. Remember, it was the plan of God. It was God's will to bruise him and crush him. It was God's will that he would die for us. Okay? 
this is not a sad thing. Next verse. It says, in bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their, their salvation perfect through suffering. Jesus was made perfect through suffering. That his, he was, and, and, and perfection, let me explain this perfection to you. He was given a duty. He was, giving, he was given by God a purpose to come to the earth. Was it God's purpose for him to, you know, to raise Lazarus from the dead? That was sure that was part of it. Was it God's purpose for him to heal the blind men and the beggars and to, and to heal those people of leprosy? Absolutely. That was part of God's plan. But the real plan, the culmination of the plan of God was that Jesus would go to the cross and take my sins and your sins and say, I will bear them. I will take their punishment. I'll take, you know, I, 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 I have it. And for him, for Jesus to go to the cross and have God turn his back on him. And that he be separated for the first time from Almighty God. That's why Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Not because, not, you know, not because the nails hurt or the spear hurt or... Anything that the, the crown of thorns hurt, not that any of that stuff hurt, it was because he was, that sin, he had never experienced the separation of sin that came upon him when he bore our sins. Okay? <clears throat> but he was made perfect through that suffering. Next verse. Both, this is so good. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are the same family. Did you get that? That's, a, that's important. Holy means called out, set apart, belonging to God now. And both the, both, the, both the one, God was, Jesus was holy, he was sinless, he was perfect, and in his holiness he went to the cross, bore our sins, and, and he's holy, and because he's holy, I'm holy. That makes me happy. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are the same family. That's why over in Romans chapter 8, it says, it says that we, we don't have a, a, a spirit of an orphan, but we can cry out, Abba, Father. Abba means Daddy. We cry out, Abba, Father, and we have an, an inheritance. And it says, actually says that we are joint heirs with Christ. Oh my. Amen. Anybody ever receive an inheritance? Terry has? Susie has? Yeah? You have, the way it works most of the time, you have. Three or four brothers and sisters, and, and they're all joint heirs. And and whatever whatever is left is split up between three or four or whatever, and, and your joint heirs they're you're the same. And I'm not just joint heirs. I'm not just joint heirs with some rich guy. I'm joint heirs with Christ. The, at least Terry's smiling. That's good. I'm joint. I'm a, you are a joint heir with Christ if you belong. If you belong to Jesus, you, you, the same that what Jesus received, you're a joint heir with Him. Oh my! Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call you brother. Oh my! <clears throat> Remember that guy was talking about his way up here, you know, and you're afraid to approach him and, and talk to him, uh, and, you know, that he wouldn't have time for you, that you, you know, right, you don't have time for the little people, you know, like yourself. No, 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 no. 
Not only, not only is Jesus not ashamed to say, you know, uh, I know Roger, I know Terry, yeah, I know that. He, he not only says that, he says, they're my brother, they're my sister. What? My brother. That, that's good stuff. Not, not only, not only, you know, everybody's got family members that you're ashamed of, right? Or you, maybe not ashamed of, that's probably not right. Or you just got family members, you wish they were the way they were. <laughs> got a couple, but anyway. Uh, Jesus looks at us and he doesn't go, oh, yeah, yeah. That's my, yeah, that's, that's my brother. Uh, yeah, I'm related to that guy. He doesn't say that. He said, so Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. Next verse. It says, this, there we go. I'll declare your name to my brothers in the presence of the congregation. Not only is Jesus not ashamed of you, but he'll declare your name. He'll declare your name to the Father. He'll declare your name to say, yes, she belongs to me. He belongs to me. I know him. I know Jack. I know Jeff, Debbie. I know Steve. I know Jimmy. I know Jack. If I didn't call your name out, though, don't feel bad. I'm 55, you know, I don't remember all the names. <clears throat> That's awesome. That the Lord of glory is not ashamed to call you and declare you that you are his brother and that you are a joint heir with him. And that he would sit beside Almighty God and speak to him and say, I know that guy. He's my brother. He's my sister. She's my sister. We're joint heirs together. We're going to inherit the kingdom of God together. Hallelujah. Next verse. He says, he says, and again, I'll put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children of God has given me. These are all, all those things were in parentheses are quotes either from Isaiah chapter 8 or um, Psalm 22. Next verse. Trying, trying to land the plane. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. Back up. That was too good to go run through. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. In his death, Jesus has destroyed the devil. <laughs> like, well, how? Well, the next verse tells us that. The next verse says, And to free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. What, what's the greatest fear that any man could have? I mean, probably the fear of death, right? The, I mean, and, and Jesus... And Jesus, in, in his death, in his death, destroyed the devil. And, and the reason that he destroyed the devil was he loved us. And he no longer wanted us as, as men to be held in bondage by the devil's power of the fear of death. The, the Bible says that the power, of, the power of sin is death, right? Right? And so he freed us of that sin by his atoning work. And because we are freed from sin, we are freed from death. The devil doesn't have any power over us. The power, the devil can't, well, yeah, somebody can take my life. That's true. That, that missionary in the Congo, that we're the Church of God missionary. The reality is, Whoever has him, they can take his life. They can take his physical life. But they can never separate him from God. Remember, remember the little guy from Pakistan? Um, what was his name? Masih. Paul, Paulus Masih. And he... And <clears throat> the devil... He, he, he gave this testimony that the devil said... If you, if you keep preaching the gospel, I'm going to kill you. And he said, he said, I said to the devil, don't threaten me with heaven. Right. Don't threaten me with heaven. Yeah, it's, it's scary. 
thinking that. It's, it's scary thinking. I'm sure that physically that missionary is, is scared out of his, you know, out of his mind because he's been taken captive. I mean, physically, he's got to be. But spiritually, if they take his life, they're going to send him to heaven. He's going to be with Jesus. And, and if that's all, if, if that's all, if, if that is removed, the fear of death is removed. What, what else does the devil have? I'll make you sick. You know? I, so we've been released from that fear of death by, by our Savior. That death being, death being that eternal separation from God. If, if you die today and you are a son of God and you are a joint heir with Christ, you'll be with him today. If I leave this earth today and, and, and God takes me home, or even if some terrorist sends me home, I'm going to be home. Hallelujah. Right? And so I don't have to fear. I don't fear death. I'm not talking about physical death. I'm talking about, I'm talking about eternal death being separated from God forever. Yes. That's what's scary. And that's what Jesus released us from. He didn't release us from the fact that biologically you'll never die. Heck, men have been dying since Adam and Eve. Or since Abel. That's part of biological life. We, we leave. You know? We go home when we're born again. And Jesus has taken that fear that, that you know what? I, I, I will never be separated from Almighty God. That's good stuff. All right, next verse. It says, For surely it's not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. Jesus didn't come to save the angels. He came to save men. Because we're made in the image of God. For surely it's not his angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. Next verse. For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and a faithful high priest, in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Jesus not only represents us as the high, our high priest, who, who, who as a man represents us to God, who goes between us. He's not only the one who, who, who goes in and ministers, but he's also the one, the atoning sacrifice that provided, who provided the blood that allows us access. That you, did you understand that? See, you couldn't, you can't go in. You couldn't go in. The high priest couldn't go into the presence of God, into the, into the presence without a sacrifice. He always had to go in with an atoning sacrifice, which was a bowl of blood that would be sprinkled on the mercy seat, right? Well, Jesus went in not only as the high priest, but went in with his own blood. And, and he was the priest and the sacrifice. And it says he had to be made just like us in every way. That blows my mind to think that my Savior was just like me. He knows what I'm going through. He knows, he knows the times. From my, you, you know, does that mean that sometimes that Jesus doubted? Yes. That Jesus had doubts about who he was at times. Did, did Jesus have, have have doubts that God would do some of the miracles? Yes, because I've, I've had those doubts. So Jesus has had those doubts. Has he had weaknesses when he, you know, when he was angry, when he was tempted, when he was, was he ever tempted with lust? Yes, he's just like us. Every way, but he didn't sin. And he was made in every way like us so that he could represent us to God. That he could go in and say, here's what, here's mankind. I represent, I represent all my brothers. And God looked at him and said, you are a worthy sacrifice. Your blood is a, is a worthy sacrifice. And because he was able to go in. The Bible says that, that that curtain was rent from the top to the bottom. And now you and I can go in. We can go into the presence of God because of what Jesus did. I think it's the last verse. 
Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. Is that the last one? Yep. Okay, good. Very good. I got one last thing I want to do. Not only is Jesus my high priest and your high priest, but he's your beloved, like I started out with at the beginning. My beloved is mine and I am his. So, so not, you know, it's one thing to have a high priest who loves you, knows everything, and, and, and who is, it's the right word, to have, you know, a, a high priest who, who knows what you've been through, knows what you've been tempted with, and all that, but, but to have a high priest who's not only, not only a high priest, but also your beloved person that it would be it would be it's even better than uh knowing that peggy was seated next to god interceding for me it would be even better than that when i go in and i and i pray that i know peggy for the most part has my interest in me. when i do good so you see that's what make, not makes her perfect but not perfect if I do, don't do good, then she gets mad at me. But maybe Jesus gets mad at me too. I've been taking a hole of her quit. <laughs> um, but but knowing that not only the person who's interceding for you and the person that you who, who who you have access to God by is not only your high priest, but also someone who you're in a relationship with that you love. It's like having having an inside source, you know. It's like having having somebody on the inside that loves you and can open keys and doors for you and all that. Only it's legitimate. It's our perfect, loving Savior, Christ, who is not only our High Priest but our beloved. And <clears throat> we're going to sing as we close today. Steve, you ready? Might need you. Stand your feet. You got those words up there, Susie? Which ones? Um, just, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want to give you one more opportunity. I, I want to give you an opportunity to receive Christ today. Um, you can, it's not about, like I said, it's not about obeying a bunch of rules that's you know god works on us he loves us the way we are but he loves us enough not to leave us that way is the best way i think i could say it but well if we go back to hebrews chapter four that verse it says that we can approach and receive mercy and grace to help in time of need you know you have to approach you have to make the approach. God won't force you to, it, it, Jesus won't force you into a relationship with him. You have to approach him. Now it's always tough, you know, when you're, when you're a young man dating, you've got enough, enough courage to ask a girl out. you got to approach. It kind of works that way with God. You know, you have to approach him. We have to approach that throne and, and receive that mercy. You have to reach out for God. You have to come. You have to come to Him to start that relationship with Him. And <clears throat> God just kind of put a, a, a song. It's an old hymn. And as we sing this, if you don't know Jesus, that you like to you like to receive Him as your Lord and Savior, you just make your way down here. Um, but the hymn is blessed assurance, and it really comes. Really reminded me of that. My, I am my beloved's, he is mine. But the, I think Susie can put the words up there. That there, huh?
Ready? You're good. You're good. I, well, I, but this, this song really speaks of our relationship with Christ. And it's not the fact that it, it, it's not the fact that you prayed a prayer or whatever. It's the fact that you've entered in a relationship with someone who wants to spend time with you. The Lord of glory wants to talk to you, wants to fellowship with you, wants to become your beloved, and he wants you to become his. Ready to sing? Father, I just pray right now that as, as we sing this, this old hymn, Lord, I, I pray, Lord, that the words of this hymn will reach out and touch our hearts and make us, make us realize that we have a great high priest who is our beloved, that we belong to him. And, and because he represents us to you, because he is there for us, or because he knows the way that we're tempted, Lord, we can approach you with confidence and boldness and, and to come humbly before your throne and receive what you have for us. Father, I thank you that I pray over every person here today. And I thank you that, that, you know, when we mess up, change our hearts. It's our flesh yes. that wants to run from you. Yes. Lord, when we mess up, let us run to you. Yes. Let us, let us run to you and, and be cleansed and washed and not have to feel the sin and, the, and that entanglement. Lord, that we might be free and walk with you. So, Lord, as we sing today and, and in closing this, this hymn, Father, let it touch our hearts and let us realize who you are as our Lord and Savior. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God.
Amen. That He's for you and He's not against you. That He's your beloved and you can call on Him and you have access to the throne of grace by your, your great and high priest, Jesus Christ. Bless our marriages, our homes, our children. Father, let us have a great week and let us be blessings wherever we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.